All right, let's see. Got the video going, the audio seems to be working, so I think we're ready to go. It is the 19th of October. Bing bong. Must move mouse pointer back onto secondary screen. Go, better. This is so boring. Logistics, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh, right, here we go. Uh, the Design Project 3 team declaration deadline is, is that right? Is today at 2359? That's right. I thought it was yesterday. I think it was Tuesday. At any rate, because, and the reason I say that is because I spent like four hours yesterday manually building groups to copy it from one list to another on this idea that the list that uses your selected team doesn't work the same as the lists when I select it. I think that one's wrong. At any rate, next week, a couple of deadlines. Um, Design Project 3 is due Tuesday. Yeah, that's why I think the team was today, not, uh, not today. Uh, anything else? Nope. Implementation reports due next Thursday. Okay. Cross whatever it says on Canvas. That's really what matters. I don't seem to be able to get dates right. Another failure, this one, I'm going to pick on Microsoft today. I try to rotate around. Um, I need to pick up an AWS one. They've got plenty of them. So this was uh, 2018, where this one was kind of interesting because this was about an electrical storm in Texas. And the fact that it caused sags and swells. So the voltage dropped below certain levels and went above certain levels that are considered to be acceptable. And this caused the air conditioning to shut down. And I can tell you that one of the things that I know from a lot of discussions with people who build data centers is air conditioning is really important because pieces of silicon do not work well when the temperature gets too high. I've personally experienced this. Um, things start to not behave very reliably. And this is such a big problem that, in fact, we've built our devices to be able to do things like thermal throttling, where it will literally cut the performance of your CPU in order to avoid melting. Uh, anybody have a CPU in their computer? No. What's the usual temperature for a CPU? Yeah, 60 to 60 to 80, depending on the CPU. Um, normally, when it gets above 75 or 80, though, it will kick in thermal throttling. I mean, I'm, I'm the one who's got the, the NVIDIA 4090 that I, I, I look at every morning, and it's like running 32 or 33 degrees. And that's when I'm using it. It's like I've never seen it above 40. So by golly, that's because I had a heat problem with the CPU, not the GPU. But I had a problem with the CPU and because the, the cooling unit failed. And this is exactly what we're talking about. Same thing. I just got a little microcosm of it. In my case, my 64-core Threadripper turned into a 16-core Threadripper because it was trying to make sure that it didn't melt down. Oh, well, this is kind of what's going to happen here. So, of course, um, the chillers go out because we want to protect the chillers. But, of course, what are the chillers there for? They're there to protect the CPUs, which are way more expensive than the chillers. Uh, the backup cooling was in manual mode because it was... Um, uh, they just installed some new equipment where all the testing wasn't complete. So this is kind of like, you know, we're switching between leaders sort of thing, and we didn't quite, right? And bad things happen. Um, so, hey, it, you know, it turned a red light on someplace, but nobody actually noticed. I don't know if you've ever had something like this happen, where the failure indicator is, like, some place you don't normally look. This is one of my pet peeves with Windows is that it puts all of the failures in the event log. And I know that I always go to look at the event log to notice that my hard drive is melting down, which isn't very useful because normally by the time I'm looking in the event log, it's because the drive has already failed. 
Uh, so the temperatures begin to rise, and they reach uh, temperatures that trigger infrastructure devices themselves and servers to shut down as a, an act of self-preservation. And you see where this is going, right? You know, it's like things get bad really fast here. Oh, no. Um, temperatures increase so quickly, they exceeded what we had designed it for. This is why design is important, even in data centers, especially in data centers. Um, bad things happened. I've talked about hard drives. Petrov's talked about hard drives. Do you know that you can actually get the data off of a hard drive after it's gone through a fire? There are companies that specialize in this. They walk into a post-burned building and they will read the data off of the melted oxide. I can tell you they are not cheap. Most people do not pay the kind of money it takes to recover that sorts of data. This is why we build distributed data and we replicate things, because it's cheaper to build six copies of it than it is to have one of those recovery experts come in there and get 95% of our data back. Um, so lots of bad things happen. It's, it's a really interesting write-up. Like When you can find these, somebody put one on, um, on Discord yesterday. It was great. Yesterday, the day before, they put a, one of these failures in. And these things pop up all the time. And they pop up on my, on my news feed, probably because you know, somebody's listening and they know that I talk about failure all the time. Um, unexpected things happen at the worst of times. Failures compound recovery is slow and painful. And core service failures make other things fail. Now, just to give you an idea of the kind of impact we're talking about here, this literally impacted the VS Code editor. Anybody use VS Code? Literally, the marketplace was knocked out because of a voltage sag due to an electrical storm in Texas. Um, nobody uses Azure Active Directory anyway, so nobody cares about that. <coughs> uh, so on and so forth. You know, a whole bunch of Azure services. Let's talk about Petrov chapter 13. And then we're going to go back to Klepman. Right, let's... No. I don't know, because I was... This is the problem. I can't remember what I was preparing for versus what I'm talking about today. Is it Klepman or Petrov today? Isn't it Kle uh, Petrov? Okay, well, good. All right. Because I think I'm preparing the slides for Klepman 5, which is replication. Uh, right, and this is complementary with Kleppman Chapter 7. So there's, there's, they're not exactly the same. I think that they actually do an interesting job of buttressing each other in different ways. Petrov is very hands-on, very pragmatic. This is how we actually build these systems. And uh, Kleppman is coming at this from a more academic, but he still has a lot of experience building these things. But he's a more academic background, so he's doing it more, uh, more, a little more theoretical. Two of them, I think, mesh pretty nicely. I can tell. All right, so let's define some terms here. Atomic means all or nothing. The term atomic is from Latin, and it literally means indivisible. So when we talk about atoms in physics, they were proposed as being the smallest possible particle. Now, of course, anybody who studied even rudimentary physics knows they're not the smallest part possible uh, particle because we have uh, we have electrons and neutrons and protons. And then, of course, the really, uh, the more gearheaded oriented physics people will know that we have quarks and leptrons, uh, muons and uh, Higgs bosons. And, and we only figured out, well, we knew about Higgs bosons. We theorized Higgs bosons a while ago, but we only actually confirmed their existence, what, like two years ago? Early, recent, like within your lifetime. So, yeah, the term atomic didn't actually have quite that meaning. And indeed, even in the way we're using it, our atomic operations are made up of smaller operations. We construct this thing that we say is atomic, indivisible. So this is a conceptual idea, then. The idea being that we have a series of discrete operations we have to perform, but they must perform either all together 
or not at all. So my observation is that consistency in, in distributed systems, actually in systems in general, means that the state of the system satisfies a set of invariants. I'm putting this together, and I've talked a little bit about invariants, and if you go back and you read, um, somebody commented on this, Paxos Made Simple, uh, Lamport starts from a set of invariants and develops a protocol relative to those invariants. So the thing I like about using this as a definition of consistency is that it tells us the reason that people don't always get consistency right is because they don't actually know what their invariants are. And that's a bad way of writing distributed systems. Yeah, well, you know, we'll just do some stuff to the database and hope we get it right. So what does it mean to have an invariant? It means there is some statement I can make about the visible part of my system, the externally visible, the internally visible stuff, that's what we're, why we're building transactions in the first place. It's externally visible. These are things that I know will be true. And I came up with a couple of dumb examples of, of that. So in, in accounting, very, very highfalutin idea, they use a mechanism of, of ensuring that columns and rows are the same super high level hand wavy argument, but basically that becomes an invariant. The way they prevent errors from creeping into this, the, the accounting system is by ensuring that we have two different columns of numbers that add up to the same value. We have, when we, when we introduce transactions in a, an accounting system, we are creating multiple entries that have to offset each other, so they have to be equal. Those are invariants. That's really all we're talking about. So when we say it's consistent, we mean exactly that same kind of consistency. And it, hopefully that's easier to understand than this hand wavy idea of consistent. What the hell does he mean? Well, it means that we can test to see if the system is in a state that we consider to be acceptable. So the benefit of using this particular approach is it means now you can define what your invariants are. What things do I say will be true? And then you can build ways of testing that. We talked about formal modeling and verification. That's what it does. You build a set of invariants, and then the model checker will check to make sure it cannot find any schedule of events that will lead you to an inconsistent state. And an inconsistent state is one that violates your invariants. Honestly, the way I usually manifest these is when I'm writing code, and I do, I've written a lot of operating systems code. Um, some of it's still in production. I learned a long time ago to put asserts in my code. When I get to this spot, this is what I think is going to be true. And if it's not true, stop and tell me it's not true. Don't blindly plow ahead and use bogus data. That's not formal verification, but it is a use of invariance in order to improve the robustness of the systems that I build. The two-phase commit protocol is an old and well-understood mechanism for creating atomic operations out of discrete non-atomic operations. Step A, step B, step C, step D all happen together or none of them happen at all. And so the idea is that on each end of that transaction, my invariants are true. The intermediate states, when I'm in the middle there, my invariants might not be true internally. But that's why I said it's what outside we can see. We need to be able to confirm or verify these outside. If we have some sort of intermediate state and we have a recovery mechanism, we're just going to enforce those invariants against the post-recovered state. We're not saying that everything you have to do is always going to leave you in a crash situation in a consistent state, but you need to have the information necessary to get to a consistent state, to one where your invariants are now true again. Pretty straightforward. We have a coordinator and a cohort. I, there are lots of different ways. Nobody in systems likes to use the same terminology in these papers, right? So coordinator and cohort is what um, 
Petrov used, so I'll stick with that. The coordinator is, in essence, the leader. This is the one that keeps track of all of the different things that are going on and records whether or not all of the participants in the transaction, the cohort, agreed to complete the transaction or not. So we have an initialization phase, do whatever you got to do, either implicitly or explicitly start a transaction because you have to link the, the causally related operations here, the things that have to be done atomically, you have to link them together somehow. And so normally we have what we call a transaction ID. That's an implementation detail, but that's the basic idea, idea of it, is that all of the things I do to affect this set of changes are linked together through some common transaction identifier. Life goes on. We do our, our individual little operations under the transaction. And then eventually, whoever's running the transaction, which is not the coordinator, this is the application that's running this, comes back and says, I've made all my changes. And now the coordinator steps in and says, OK, I'm going to contact everybody who's involved in this transaction and ask them to vote for or against this, this transaction. And in this particular case, everyone must vote for it. I mentioned this last time. This is the 100% quorum. Why? These aren't duplicate changes. These are arbitrary changes. So when we were talking about quorum consensus before, we were talking about trying to replicate exactly the same piece of data in lots of different places. Well, if everybody agrees, let's say we're doing project uh, design project one, which was uh, DS Labs project three, which is the primary backup. Let's say we wanted to have two backups instead of one. We could have built a transactional model where we can't commit the operation the client has asked us to perform until the primary and the two backups have all acknowledged it. You do that with a transaction. But when you read through Petrov and you read through Kleppman, you begin to understand, hey, you know, um, there's kind of a problem with two-phase commit. We're going to get to that. But this is simple. It's really easy to reason about. It's to say, everybody agrees. The coordinator records the fact that everybody agreed. And then he tells everybody, we agreed. In 2PC, everything is done synchronously. That's the pure 2PC, which I always find interesting because I've never seen anybody implement anything quite that pure. Normally, there are classes of failure we can handle here that don't require that we do infinite blocking. What can fail? Is there a question? Whoever started that transaction is going to have to retry it because the transaction didn't go through. Yes. It has to retry it. Well, that's highly simplistic, but OK. Yeah, so if you keep everything in memory. We talked about write-ahead logs before, right? The reason we have write-ahead logs are because they allow us to build recoverable transaction stores. So I kind of introduced transactions before and hand waved them away. And now I'm going back and trying to make sure we really pin it down in, in greater detail. Um, one model, and the simplest model, is that you don't commit anything to persistent storage that hasn't already been agreed upon that you're going to roll forward. And that's a stat of the simplest write ahead log models work that way. But realistically, we often don't want to do that. And part of it is because these things can become very large and they're not time bounded. And so then you have to start recording state. The strict requirement there is, and this is why I, I expressed it slightly differently. I said a transaction aborts, we can roll back to what the system looked like before that transaction started. Transaction commits, we can roll forward to what the system looks like after that transaction has been fully applied. 
That's a much more general statement than a specific implementation detail like we're going to keep it in memory. Keeping it in memory makes certain things easier to reason about, but what do you do if your transaction won't fit in memory? What are you, and, and you can say, well, my transactions are all small. Yes, but what if you have lots of small transactions, each of which takes three and a half months to finish? You're going to run out of memory eventually. So the moment you decide you're going to start committing it into per persistent storage, because you need to reuse that memory somehow, you're going to end up with some sort of journal or log that allows you to recover back to the original, uh, original pre-transaction state. So this is always the danger when people start telling you how it can be implemented, is then you say, yeah, but could I do it differently? And you learn that, in fact, often you can do it differently. This is why I try to be, I try to be general and then give you a specific example and make sure that I emphasize this example is just an example. It's not necessarily the only way of doing it. Um, this is what makes this, this problem space really hard. And, and when I sit back and I look at it, I say, the only thing we do in this class is talk about how to agree on outcomes. That's it. And our outcomes are either we're changing disparate data in different locations, or we're changing the exact same data in multiple locations. And I would argue that the exact same data case is just a special case of the general. We're changing different data that's somehow related. We're changing different data in different places that we have to have happen altogether or not at all. Um, and the fun part is that when we go to the, the replication, we can bend the rules. We don't need 100% agreement. So maybe in some ways it'd be better to present the 100% agreement model and then say, hey, by the way, but I did it the opposite way, which was how do we agree on the same thing, the same data value? And look, we can play these games, but when we're trying to agree on different values, we can't, we can't pull that trick. It doesn't matter because in the end, what we're going to build are really systems that have both of these things in some way, shape, or form. So you build your key value store, and that's going to give you the, that, that's going to be replicated. But then you build your database on top of your key value store, and you're going to end up using transactions because you're changing the contents of different keys, and you need those to be serialized. And so then you build your database like that, and then you come along and somebody says, hey, how can we, how can we shard this database and replicate it out? Which is another problem that, um, that uh, Petrov and um, Putman both talk about. And that's what we're going to go through next. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I tried to bludgeon it to death. But. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does that tell you about just distributed transactions? They're slow, they're slow, they're complicated. And it's like, and so we're gonna spend a lot of the time, once we understand what the transaction is, we're gonna spend a lot of our time saying, okay, and how do we get out of doing this? Because it's slow, it sucks, it's gonna drag down our performance. And we do things like, we try to do atomic updates. So if I just change, if I can do it through just changing a single key in a key value store, or ch changing a, key, a single value in a key value store, and it's not tied to anything else, I'm not going to use a transaction. Screw that. I have atomicity at that level. Um, many times you find that you can actually perform things in an order that, that still maintains your invariance. So you don't need a transaction there. If you can do things, careful ordering is what we used to call that. If you can do things in a, in a particular order that leaves the, the, the world or the state, uh, leaves your state in a consistent spot, that's fine. You don't need a transaction for that. The problem becomes what do you do when you have state that isn't consistent and you have to transition across that? So I did, when I defined a transaction, I did define it as the minimum set of operations needed to move from one consistent state to another consistent state. And I did that deliberately. And that is because 
in the ideal world, you don't want a transaction to last any longer than you can, uh, th than you can because it becomes very complicated and prohibitively expensive very quickly. And I spent a couple of years working with people who were building online transaction processing. And it was really, really hard. And they did a really good job because they, they brought um, something called Corba into the world, which hopefully you'll never have to work with. Um, you may never have to work with it, but pretty much everything that we, the way that we build Web apps these days is all based upon this object model that they, they promulgated and ended up turning into, um, turning up into soap and then rest. Object broker model. Lots of things can go wrong in 2PC. Uh, the cohort can fail. So you can have network failure, node failure, you can have a failure after you have agreed to roll the transaction forward. So the coordinator can handle some of these things. So the simple, naive solution is I just wait until I get acknowledgments from everybody. I'm using TCP. I tell you that, that um, we've all voted and we're going we're gonna to commit this thing and roll it forward. And if, you're, if you die, I'll just wait for you forever, which is kind of the model that we started with in distributed systems, isn't it? What is the problem with that? Well, that's kind of unsatisfying. It means that a single node can take our dis distributed transaction down. So we're going to do some things that will make it easier. You don't really have to go all the way to 3PC to solve some of these problems. Put timeouts in there. But, um, and that's, that's actually what 3PC does. It puts timeouts in, it puts pre-prepare in and what. When the coordinator fails, then this is one's bad. In 2PC, when the coordinator fails, you're stuck. Can't make any forward progress until the coordinator either recovers or somebody reboots some systems. Essentially, what happens. So that's not a very good failure model. When these were transactions on a single machine, where I was making updates to different fields in a, or different tables in a database, okay, fine. That was perfectly acceptable. When we started to scale this out to distributed systems, not so. So we'll do some things asynchronously. We'll create a three-phase commit, which is asynchronous two-phase commit with an extra pass. So now we have um, a pre-commit phase. Are you, really, are, are you ready? Are you ready? How about now? And when everybody says, yes, I'm ready, then we can say, OK, then we can move forward. And we use timeouts, but we've already been using timeouts. When we were talking about this in the context of distributed consensus, we were using timeouts already to do retransmissions because we already had this problem. So in essence, 3PC is adopting some of the stuff that we've already been using to solve the distributed consensus problem. This is half the solution. So this is why there's no perfect order for teaching these things. If I teach you the 2PC way, and then I say, oh, and we got these problems, and we'll introduce 3PC, and then, oh, well, you know, but that still doesn't solve it. And so here's this new one, or I'll just show you the new one that will actually encompass everything. Then you say, well, you know, maybe you don't want to pay that price, or maybe you want something simpler, or, or maybe you want to see how we got here. Protocol is pretty simple. Initialize, form the, the, the series of operations that need to be transactionally committed. Then you ask everybody if they can commit. And if everybody says yes, so this is the first round of voting, they say yes, then you can you send out a pre-commit or you send out an abort. So you have two rounds where you can abort now. The first one is in pre-commit. Everybody's agreed. This is what we've all decided to do with this transaction. It's 100% guaranteed. And then once everybody says, I'm ready to pre-commit, now you can say, do commit. And this is where we do things. I, I mentioned this last time. This is where you end up with a protocol that basically says, I'm part of the cohort. I agreed to a pre-commit. I don't know what happened. Please tell me what happened. Because from a visibility perspective, I need to know what happened to that transaction so that I can present the correct data to the outside world. Remember, the transaction doesn't guarantee that what we see internally is consistent. It means that what people see externally is consistent. 
So I can't answer a question in which I don't know what the state of that value or the answer to that question is. So somebody reads a value out of the database and that value is part of this uncertainty area, I have to wait until I have the outcome of that transaction. So Petrov goes through a number of different systems. Yes. The third phase, um, it beca it's because we don't have to block now, right? So we've introduced this ability to not block, but it's, in essence, we need to rendezvous to figure out. It's like in, in Paxos, when we send out proposals and we gather a vote, um, we're not, we don't synchronously wait for everybody to answer. So this is just a choo version of that, because we still need to wait for everybody to tell us that they're ready to commit. Um, so we do the pre-commit thing, and if, if something goes wrong in the pre-commit phase, then we can abort at the end. But it gives us one extra round to not block. So we can, in the real world, what you end up doing is you end up sending all the pre-commits at the same time, right? Because you don't have to wait for them. But you do have to rendezvous to figure out what the final outcome was. And you can't do that with a single round. You need rounds. That second round is, in essence, everybody agreed to commit. And so I can detect the failure of a node in, in, in the pre-commit phase, because they didn't answer me. And if they didn't answer me, then I'm going to use a timeout, and I'm going to say, well, that not answering is the same as saying no. Um, well, after you've proposed, so after you've proposed committing the transaction. You've proposed committing the transaction. Everybody said they're OK with that. Yeah, but now, they ha you, now you have to tell everybody what, what finally got voted on. Yes, so that gives you that extra space so that the pre-commit guys, if everybody in the pre-commit says yes, then that means they'll be able to call the coordinator and get an answer back as to what the outcome of the transaction was later. I'd honestly never heard of Kelvin before. Um, like, okay, so this is what led me to Bigtable. That's right, because Alvin used Bigtable, and Bigtable replaced uh, the Google file system, which wasn't a file system. That's a sore point. Um, being a file systems guy and being told that a library that does I.O. is a file system is kind of like a slap in the face. Now, I didn't spend years of my life building really cool file systems to put a little library in. Um, it uses deterministic locking to avoid deadlocks. Now, this is not something that is particularly novel. And I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm going, I had been doing this for years by the time they were doing this. So this wasn't like a brilliant new idea. Um, actually, I have a couple of patents on detecting uh, out-of-order lock acquisition in, in uh, operating system. This, OS people are really sloppy. We, hey, you just create a lock, and then you do things, and then you find out that you know, that lock is being acquired at this level, and this other lock is being acquired at this other level, and there happens to be a circular dependency on them and things deadlock. But how do you detect that kind of a deadlock? How do you get rid of it? Uh, so the idea is that any time you acquire locks, you must always acquire them in a particular order. Since there is a strict ordering of the locks, you cannot have a deadlock. Because a deadlock is where I own one lock, and I'm trying to acquire a second lock. And someone else owns the second lock and is trying to acquire the first lock. In other words, we don't have a strict ordering of lock acquisition. They use deterministic scheduling to avoid using 2PC at all. In other words, what they do is they say, well, we know that operations that are performed in this particular order can be done safely in that order. OK. And this is why I said, we try to make our transactions as small as possible. If I can come up with an ordering that doesn't leave the system in an inconsistent state between any two operations there, I don't need a transaction. And you just do the operations in that order. Maybe they're order dependent one way, but not the other. It's the problem comes up when you find an operation that can't be done that way. And we do this a lot in file systems. We 
most of the time you can order things carefully so that you don't leave the state uh, the disk state inconsistent but there are a couple of cases where you need to move references around and references moving references around is what broke things rename is the case where rename looks kind of like create a hard link to to a file and then delete the old hard link to the file and there's no atomic way to do both of those operations so we had to do transactions for that So, and I was doing that work in the 90s. That was at least 10 years before Calvin. So they, they said, you know, they had a transaction sequencer. This is a trick that Google seems to like to play, because I noticed that all three of these Google systems, Petrov really seems to like Google in this chapter. All these Google systems end up with, with a global ordering of events by using a, basically a centralized clock model. They use... They use this approach in Calvin for both primary backup replication as well as multi-writer replication. Uh, multi-writer replication is a lot more interesting, and it's a lot harder because it means that I can write to different locations, different storage locations, and yet get the changes propagated across them in a correct order. Now, the reason I can do that if I have a strict ordering of operations, a trans, what is it, transaction sequencer, is because now I know the order in which the writes occurred. So therefore, I can define a racing writer solution that will be the same regardless of where it is actually done. Uh, the linear event scheduling system that they used in Calvin actually made it a lot easier to recover, and it gave them fault tolerance. Getting rid of two PC as much as possible was really good for performance. The fact that they used log replication we were using log replication in Paxos and Raft and PMMC and all these things. This isn't a new idea. Just using it here to make this as fast as possible. The thing that will kill a system like Calvin is the moment you get contention. Once you start contending, things get bad. The other thing is that when you have a global sequencer, i.e. You, you get your Lamport clock value by sending a message to somebody, you now pay a latency cost of getting a unique timestamp from the centralized sequencer. When your data center is on Mars, that's probably not a good idea. You're going to wait a long time. Spanner was a different solution that Google came up with. And I have mentioned Spanner before. This was we're going to use a global clock, but this time we're going to base it on GPS clocks and atomic clocks. And I think they spent like a half million dollars, a quarter of a million dollars per data center to get one of these very high precision atomic clocks. And you know what breaks it? Putting a data center um, on a satellite. Why? You're a physics person, obviously, or at least enough physics to know the answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, can't, I have to tell you, every time I look at distributed systems, I say, this is, this is the computer science equivalent of relativity. This is special relativity in spades. The order in which you observe things is based upon your, your reference frame and the amount of time it took for the message to get to you. Why was the speed of light so important? Because it defined the, the amount of time it would take a message to get to you. Well, when we put networks in there, we are bounded by the speed of light. We cannot send a message faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. And the speed of light, i.e. an electron, the speed of an electron in copper wire is slower than the speed of light in a vacuum. I think it's about two-thirds, if I remember right, roughly that range. One of the reasons that we are starting to look at optical computing is because it gives us a significant increase in performance. Our messages actually move faster. Well, unless you've got somebody digging your uh, fiber optic lines under the ocean between Sweden and Estonia. Hey, that was in the news today. So there's like constant little boats that just go back and forth across the oceans laying cable at the bottom so they can use, you know, you don't go to like four miles deep. Uh, sorry, that would be uh, 6.4 kilometers deep. 
You don't go six kilometers deep to go fix a, a, a splice, a break in a, in a fiber optic cable at the bottom of the ocean. What you do is you just put another cable down there. Um, so they use this global clock. They use globally consistent timestamps. They do have a, a, a known uncertainty interval. I called it epsilon because that's the traditional mathematical name for some small value. And what they actually end up doing is they end up holding messages for the epsilon bound, make sure that they don't have any ordering problems. So they put a timestamp in it, they hold it for the epsilon bound, and then they can actually send the message out. Uh, this allowed really good horizontal scaling. This was sharding, a term that I've used before, and it's a term I'll come back to. They had global transactions. That was the strict kind of transactions I was talking about in 2PC. Atomic, consistent, isolated, durable. It allowed them to do synchronous replication. They actually ran SQL Server, SQL databases on this. Well, not SQL Server because that's Microsoft, but they actually ran SQL databases on this thing. Replicated, distributed. It's all tied in Google Cloud Platform. So uh, Spanner is still in use today, as far as I know. Yes. Clocks with, a, with an epsilon bound, and you just dally the, the messages until you send them. Well, it actually turns out atomic clocks are a lot cheaper than they used to be, because I priced this out, and I think for about five grand, you could probably implement it now. But, you know, at the time, this was like 20 years ago. Um, yeah, they were really pricey. And they used a combination of atomic clocks high precision atomic clocks and GPS. Speaking of, um, yes, uh, we know about relativity because the GPS satellites actually experience relativistic time dilation effects. So we, the times are slightly wrong. Oh, I should cut that failure in there. There's a really cool failure where Linux didn't handle um, the time going backwards in the kernel and it really screwed things up. You have a question? Uh, probably about six orders of magnitude. Quartz clock, clocks are not. A quartz clock is probably not going to be more accurate than 500 picoseconds. And I think that's really pushing it. I don't think they're that accurate. But um, atomic clocks should be um, out of second. I mean, how many vibrations does it take to get to the center of that cesium atom? That didn't work very well. It was kind of like, you know, the top. Uh, so true time has limitations. It doesn't solve all the world's problems. But by golly, Google sold, sold Spanner as being a really cool solution. And it is an interesting solution for sure. Uh, let's see. Petrov talks about database partitioning. We were mentioning that in the last slide too. Horizontal partitioning where we do row level, row, row level partitioning or sharding. Vertical partitioning, where we're doing column level partitioning, which is the opposite. It's perpendicular to rows. Um, and it's weird because when you start looking at databases, you find out that there are columnar databases and there are row oriented databases and now there are vector oriented databases and there are NoSQL databases. And there are tons and tons of ways of building databases to optimize the organization of the information within them. And despite all of that, we end up putting transactions on top of them. Pretty much all the databases you ever see, unless it's a really bonehead simple key value store, will have a transaction system on top of it to allow you to make changes at different levels in the database in a consistent fashion. Sharding is really common. AV stores happen to shard really well, which is why they've become this very fundamental kind of database for building higher level databases out of. Uh, consistent hashing. So you compute a hash value, you use mod n, where n is the number of nodes you have. This is simple, everybody understands that, but the problem is that it means that if you add another server in your mix, you have to rehash everything. 
and that means you're moving all sorts of data around. So that's not a very good idea. So there are a variety of different approaches to solving this. Consistent hashing is one. It turns out to be a really simple idea, and it's pretty cool, but is not implemented in its pure form. Uh, completely different approaches. Instead, what you do is you, you use a mod number that's really, really large, and then you scatter the, the, the keys around. So you, you have multiple different mod values that map to the same node. And then when you insert a new node, now you're only moving a few pieces around. So I don't, I don't, you don't have to go into the details. It doesn't really make much difference. Just keep in mind that one of the things we do when we try to build something that is horizontally scalable is make it dynamically modifiable so we can add extra resources. Why? Well, because you know when you got started at this new company that you just you you just started working for, you only had a hundred thousand entries in your database, and then you know um, I don't you got slashed audit or something, and the next day you walk in and you realize you've got a hundred million, and now everything is going really slow, and people are looking at you going, um, excuse me, this is too slow. How are you going to fix this problem? Because we're not going to take that shackle off your leg until you do. Okay, well, you know, it turns out actually that we talked about this in 4.16 and I designed this system so I can just simply slap another 10,000 servers in there and they'll load balance the data across them and life will be good. I mean, you're not going to see that kind of instantaneous growth. But in fact, what tends to happen over time is that if you have a successful product, you end up with an ever-growing amount of data and you end up needing to have this kind of dynamic extensibility built into it. But when you're designing your key value store, you might want to think about that. You might want to say, how am I going to scale this thing? And hopefully, I've talked about enough things. I talked about Anna before. Anna is a great scalable key value store with um, eventual consistency. Life's good. Database partitioning gives us lots of scalability, performance. It makes things easier to manage because you can like replace one database server just by moving the data off of it and replace that. Uh, you can actually take the individual shards of the database and you can replicate them so that the failure of a single server inside of that shard group, nobody notices because, gosh, you're running Paxos on it. This is Design Project 3 in a nutshell. Challenges here are how do you distribute that data? Because the data doesn't always map particularly well to um, the usage pattern. This is you know, X, formerly known as Twitter, and they're trending hashtags. And the fact that this is in some key value store. And so today, what's happening is 90% of our traffic is going to one key. How do I balance that? And you know, maybe the answer is you just simply put that one key on a dedicated server for right now. And then when it goes cold, then you start moving it across to some other server. I don't know. I haven't had to design something to solve that particular problem, but it is a real world problem. SQL join operations are this interesting example that I saw in there and I said, wow, okay, yeah. does kind of make sense as I start reaching across databases, across tables in different databases, and now I've distributed these things. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to be doing joins across these databases, and it's just going to get slow and expensive. And so people spend a lot of time looking at how do I optimize this sort of thing. And there's a whole conversation in Petrov about you know, uh, secondary index sorting and whatnot. And you're not going to remember any of that. And I don't ask you to remember any of that. The point is to understand that this is a hard problem, and we have a, a set of techniques for solving that. You should probably, at this point, be looking for things to do in your capstone project. Picking up one of these problems and saying, hey, let's look at this particular problem is a great approach. Maybe you want to build yourself a key value store. Hey, I can build a key value store. Yay! Maybe you want to design um, that Martian data center. Cool. Those are all really interesting things to do. 
most of the time when you actually get into the real world, you're going to have somebody telling you what they want you to do. And they're going to have almost no clue what it takes to do that. So the reason to introduce you to these ideas and to these concepts is so at least you have an inkling of where to start. And then two years later, you're going to find out that you're the expert on it. There's nobody else at the company who knows how to do this stuff. And then when it comes time for raises, yeah, um, well, you know, uh, money talks. Or maybe you're doing your own startup company. Oh, I guess this is the one with big table. Percolator, another one I'd never heard of before. Uh, continuous updates of the Google search index. Right, so Percolator is the one that used Big Table. Big Table is the system, the storage system that replaced uh, uh, Google File System. Google File System is also known as Hadoop. Hadoop is based on the ideas from the Google File System. And Google kind of gave up on GFS pretty fast. They said this isn't the right model, and they built um, Big Table, which is still in use. So they use distributed transactions. They have locks and timestamps and metadata operation. They, yes, look at this. We're going to have a centralized timestamp server again. They really don't like doing the, the kind of reasoning that we were talking about when we were doing Paxos. They want a strict ordering of events. So a, a global timestamp service gave us a strict ordering of events. Uh, in, in Spanner, we didn't get a strict ordering, but we got something that was pretty close to a strict ordering that we could reason about. And once we held the messages long enough, we then knew we had a strict ordering because nobody could see our message too early. Pretty weird, but okay. It worked. They proved it worked. They use um, the observer framework, which I would note is basically kind of like snapshot isolation. So I make a copy of what it looks at right now. And then you don't have to worry about it being changed by anybody else. And then at the end, we reconcile this by saying, did it change? And if it did change, we abort the transaction. And if it didn't change, we commit the transaction. I talked about snapshot isolation last time, too. One of the interesting things about Percolator is that it actually shows how you can add transactions on top of a non-transactional system. And you may very well be called to do something like that. I've built some really chuchy transactional systems that worked really well, though, just using file system semantics and file system operations. So, like, what I would do is I'd put, uh, you'd open a file, you have a directory, which is where all your transactions are going. You'd open a file, and each file you opened was the transaction. And then you would write records into the transaction. And when you were done with the transaction, you deleted the file because everything was committed at that point. It was kind of cool. It was like, this is how I recover. So my log is, here are all the things I need to do. And when they've all been done, I don't need to do them anymore, and I just throw them away. Um, I helped a little Swedish startup company do that, and then they turned around and like six months later sold their company for $12 million. Time was a lot of money. And then they went off to do, you know, whatever they did for the company that bought them. I know quite a few people who end up working for companies after their company was bought. Um, a friend at uh, Microsoft, two friends at Microsoft, one of them uh, built a, a whole system for doing containerized isolation of applications. And they sold their company to Microsoft in 2008, I think, for a quarter of a billion dollars. Sorry? No, no, this is pre-Docker. This was actually, um, it's, it's what's called AppFee. Application virtualization. Because I built the whole file system layer for them in 2000. I, I worked with them to build their whole file system isolation layer. And it just took the application and the file system. So it was pre-Docker. It was the same general kind of idea, but uh, it was a different implementation of it. Then Docker came along, and of course, they ended up implementing, never mind. That's not where we need to be here. Coordination avoidance is a huge issue here, because when we have to lock things, to coordinate our activity, or we have to use snapshot isolation to do rollback in the case where we conflict, those become expensive and they drag our performance down. So as much as possible, what we want to do is avoid getting into a situation where we have to coordinate anything. Share nothing 
is a common approach to this in certain kinds of systems where I don't share any data. And if I don't share any data, I can't have any coordination requirements. But not sharing anything means there's a class of problems that I can't solve easily. So there's always a trade-off here. Uh, coordination relies on network communications in our distributed systems, so that becomes slow. We have to deal with the drop and disordered packet problem, and we have to worry about node failure. OK, gee, this is where we started at the beginning of the term, when I started throwing distributed consensus at you. It's the same set of problems, just in a slightly different space. Um, so sometimes we can merge operations together and guarantee that we don't violate our invariants. In other words, it doesn't really matter the order in which we do them. I, I gave you some examples of that. For example, uh, you know, if, if we're just adding or subtracting from a value, the order in which we do those things doesn't matter because we're going to end up with the same value. This is the whole isometric or uh, isomorphic isometric isomorphic schedule. Doesn't matter what order I do these operations in, I end up with the same result. I don't really need to coordinate those, but you can actually do model checking when you do invariant uh, confluence since you've got your invariants and you can explore the state space to make sure that you've actually got it right. You look at what happens when I merge these pair of operations. If I can merge this pair of operations, I can merge this other pair of operations, then I can merge all of those operations together. Well, I'd have to do it all pairwise, but yes. And eventually I can reach a point where I can reason about what can I push together. What can I converge? The benefits of having invariant confluence is it means that we don't have to coordinate. And that means we don't have to worry about the latency. We get better, better throughput and better availability because I don't have to worry about the failure of an individual node. It can come back tomorrow and uh, say that I took two widgets out of inventory. So. That was a good example because that actually does indicate there could be a problem there. If I, somebody else becomes causally tied into this because they read the value, they said, are there two widgets in inventory that I can take out? Then, and I said, yes. Well, the two that somebody else took out but hadn't updated yet will become a problem. So you can see this isn't always a perfect solution. There are times when we end up having causal ordering constraint. I can't ship more widgets than I have in stock. I can sell more widgets than I have in stock. Talk to any good salesperson, they'll sell things they don't have. But when you're in shipping and you go to the shelf and you say, uh, there's no widgets here. Can't ship them. This is the quintessential example of weaker consistency. Yeah, I thought I had two in stock and I sold them to you, but unfortunately we're now out of stock and you can wait until December of 2026. I had ordered garbage bags for our overpriced designer garbage can from Amazon and it said they wouldn't be available here until December. Like, do you have to go like, kill the dinosaurs and squish them and turn them into plastics? December. Six weeks to get garbage can liners? Good Lord. Oh, well. Way easier just to use the old plastic bags that used to get at the grocery store. Can't do that anymore. Now they're all paper bags. At any rate. Uh, an example of cases where we do a lot of coordination avoidance are NoSQL no databases, like uh, MongoDB. There you go. That was uh, Rav. Chapter 13, and then next we're doing um, Putman Chapter 5, which is uh, replication. That's what I was working on earlier today, was looking at the stuff I have to do for Chapter 5. Um, although I am considering maybe instead talking about capstone project ideas, because I already 
I was thinking about that and I already got somebody afterwards going, uh, what should I do for capstone project? And I kind of hesitate to give you too many, or give you too few ideas, I suppose, because I don't actually care what that capstone project is. This is your opportunity to explore the distributed system space and try to find something interesting to work on in an environment where you have absolutely nothing to lose. Because that's not going to be the case once you walk out those doors and get a real job. Most of the projects you work on, somebody's going to be saying, here's the problem I want you to solve, here's my half-assed idea about how you should solve it, and then you have to sit down and try to figure out how am I going to do this using this weird ass idea that some business person or senior dev who is clearly demented has decided I have to do? So you don't have to do that for this project. You could actually say, hey, I want to write, I mean, we're talking about, you know, um, social uh, media apps uh, like Tinder. Right? You want to talk about things that use distributed systems? Great. I think last term, actually, somebody did that. They did a little messaging app, and it used eventual consistency. And in that case, you want, what is it, read my rights consistency, right? Because you want to make sure your messages show up. Maybe it was right consistency. I don't know. You want to make sure your messages show up in the right order for you, even if they show up in the wrong order for somebody else. But you might want, you know, so, so there's different consistency models. You could explore that space and say, that's something's really interesting to me. I heard somebody else say they wanted to build a database. I'm like, that's really cool. Build a database. And I've talked a lot about key value stores. You could be really boring and build a nice, you know, recoverable key value store. Or you could find some interesting open source project that you really like and say, this is pretty cool. What could I contribute to, what could I contribute to this and make that my capstone project? I don't actually care. The purpose here is not to look at what you actually produce, because let's face it, you're going to produce shit. You're laughing, but you know it's true, right? It's, it's going to be one more stupid student project, and you're going to be, be and, and there's going to be one person in here who says, no, you know what? This is my opportunity to get a jump start on my startup company, and by golly, I'm going to have the world's greatest whatever it is. And that's cool, too. Um, one person was talking about using a, a modeling program in a modeling library that works in Rust and, and developing invariants and being able to test things there. You want to sit down and build your own Paxos implementation that does that? Cool. Really awesome. I've suggested doing flexible Paxos because I don't think there's a library, not that I know of yet, that implements flexible Paxos. And if you want to use it as an opportunity for exploring an idea like that to say, I'm not going to get a full flexible Paxos library built in whatever it is, but I could probably design one. Maybe I could learn enough about TLA plus or Pluscal or, or you know, whatever model checking language you find really snazzy and, and use this as an opportunity to explore that. And that's really the goal here. The goal here is for you to identify something that you find interesting and drill down in it. And what I'm looking for is to see, how do you go about that? Do you do it in this half-assed way going, oh, you know, all I gotta do is click, click, submit, 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 because that's not the way that these are going to be. Or did you actually take some of the things we've been talking about in here to art and say, I can write a design. How many of you have actually looked at the designs from uh, design project one that we, we pointed out? Some of them were pretty good, weren't they? Like, they weren't total crap. And that means that a few of you did write total junk. Some of you might have actually written something that you said, well, it wasn't bad, but it could have been better. That's the only goal here, really. Try and use this as an opportunity to take those skills and apply it to a problem that you get to pick. You're not going to get a chance to do that very often. So that's hard in that it's not something that you're used to doing but it's also an opportunity in that it's not something you're going to get a chance to do too often. Anybody in here want to do a startup company and become filthy rich? You just, uh, anybody want to come become filthy rich? How many of you are already filthy rich? Okay, so um, there's more people who want to be filthy rich than actually are filthy rich. I, 
I can tell you I know at least one UBC undergrad who is now a multi-billionaire and possibly more. Graduated a long time before you. Um, so think about it. In this first week, I knew that you were basically going to like walk into the deadline for the first report, the capstone project, and probably be going, <gasps> I haven't really thought about this yet. But now's your time to start thinking about it. So like I said, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try to talk about that a little bit more next time, give you at least some ideas. I have talked about a number of different ideas and different approaches and different problems in this space. But this is really your opportunity to dig through Petrov and say, oh, gee, look, I want to build Calvin. That'd be cool, too. The point is, in the end, what I want to see in your final report is, what did I do? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? What did I learn from the process? And how would I do better next time? Because that's what really matters in the real world continuous improvement. Being able to look at your own work and type, you know, write something more than most of you seem to have written for the, uh, the peer feedback, which was, oh yeah, this is cool. Or I really like your diagrams. The goal here is to actually be able to critically look at your own work and to say, how can I make this better? Because that's a valuable skill set. That's something that you probably didn't get out of your other classes. I don't know. Have you done a lot of introspection, metacognition? You know what metacognition is? So the idea behind metacognition is learning how you think to gain more insight into how your own brain works and how, you, how can you be more efficient. These are hard problems. I mean, I'm hand-waving through dozens of hard problems every lecture. They're turning into lectures or less discussions than I'd like, but... So it's not like this isn't a field full of them. I mean, does anybody have an idea of what they want to do for a capstone yet? Or at least explore? What, do, what are you thinking of? A distributed file system that balances memory across file servers. OK, cool. Like distributed shared memory kind of model, or? Ah, so you're going to do load balancing of the files. OK, um, cool. I mean, I know the, the interesting thing about this is that the demand of servicing small files is very different than the demand of servicing large files. So you could go either direction with that. You could say, hey, I'm going to provide a unified interface, a unified namespace, so that the files look like they're in the same place, but I'm going to choose where to store them based upon their size, because then I can pick different service levels or different guarantees. But there's lots of different ways to go with that. So yeah, to try and do load balancing is cool, like IPFS maybe. The interplanetary file system, which is how you get blockchain into this. Anybody going to do a blockchain project? He's going to be building um, UBC coin. Ah. A decentralized exchange. OK. What would your decentralized exchange be for? Ah, uh, OK, cool. Um, yeah, so one of the interesting cases in that instance is uh, there was a whole model of using blockchain for land title registry, because one of the problems in countries is that land title registries can be compromised. In other words, you can go and break into a land title registry and, oh, all the documents burned. Well, we're just going to have to reconstruct them as best we remember. Um, so I don't trust you, because you're going to try and steal my land. But if I distribute this around, you can end up with uh, a land title registry that actually, system that is decentralized and difficult to forge. Um, there's at least one place I know it's in use. It's sort of interesting to look at those kinds of things, right? How do, so what is the problem we're trying to solve? We're trying to solve some place where I don't trust other people. How do I solve that Byzantine problem? Just, you know, practical Byzantine fault tolerance is a precursor to, uh, to a blockchain. I haven't talked about blockchains yet. I will probably throw a discussion about that. It's a really simple idea that ends up being quite powerful. So that's a cool idea. That's great. You guys are doing good. Anybody else? Got two ideas over here. So it 
self-driving cars that communicate with each other. So that, you know, like you want to get into the lane because you need to get off of the exit. You can negotiate that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool. That was um, sort of like one of the projects that I worked on years and years ago. It was called Satellite Directed Tank-Based Warfare. And it was all about the, the, the tanks communicating with each other. Seriously, like you did localized discussions with the tanks to, to determine where they were relative to each other and what they were going to do. Same kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and that was the, that was the Canadian UBC graduate who got that project. He, he used to talk about going to DARPA meeting where they, uh, there'd be like some, some you know, three-star general stand up in the room and say, there's an alien in the room, and he would stand up and go, me? Because uh, he was Canadian, right? Most Americans can't tell the difference between Americans and Canadians, so. And some Americans who travel overseas pretend to be Canadians. They don't look like the total assholes they are. You had an idea. Cool. There you go. So if you want to, you know, you want somebody to carry you, you know where to go. Either that or it's a disaster waiting to happen. It'll be fun one way or the other. Did you? Matrix operations. So I'm going to be doing like transforms on the matrices or multiplication on the matrices, and I need to load balance these things across. These must be really big matrices. Cool, cool. Well, you know, a lot of times when you build um, graph representations, you use adjacency matrix matrices. Um, so I could see some interesting, you know, some interesting parallels between graph processing and matrix operations. That's cool. Pretty cool. Anybody there in the peanut gallery? They're hiding back there. You guys aren't planning on, anybody planning on doing a capstone project up there? Back row? They're going to be really quiet about it. They're not going to carry you. OK, cool. Well, so keep thinking about that. Um, you know, if you want, you can talk about it on Piazza. You can talk about it on Discord. Um, I tend to pay more attention to Discord than Piazza. I don't know why. I think it's because you know each day I get about 400 Piazza notifications, and like three of them are from UBC, and 397 are from Georgia Tech. And so I just they just look like noise to me. Whereas um, the only Discord that I get verbaled at regularly is the the class Discord. But you don't have to use Discord. You can use Piazza. Cool. Well, we're done. And I uh, will we'll do this again next week. Oh, I didn't take the template slide out. Oops. And we're done.